going to get started. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, it's a delight to see you. It's a big delight to see so many of you this weekend. Uh, my name is Dr. Alex Bussesi. I manage the programs in education, culture, and society, and international development here at Penn GSE. Uh, we're also serving as a member of the associated faculty. But this evening, I am here to talk to you about a very special committee that I've had the honor of chairing this year. Uh, and so last year, I went to speak to Gerald and Vivian, and I had an idea. I, I thought that uh, we should use the platform of the Ethnography Forum to highlight the new and important work going on. It was, it was an exciting opportunity, and I thought that a book award would be a perfect way to do that, um, since we already had such a great venue for, for connecting with scholars in our field. And to my delight, they said yes. And then to my consternation, they said, congratulations, you're in charge of this. And, and I had, of course, <laughs> I had, of course, never been involved in a book award committee, and so I had a bit of a learning curve, but thankfully, I had an amazing group of uh, scholars in, in, in the community and even served on, on the committee that I could draw on for figuring out exactly how to do this. Um, and so, tonight, I'm very proud to announce our first winner of the Outstanding Ethnography and Education Book Award. Um, we were delighted to receive and review 10 books. Uh, and I have to say, it was a hard decision. Uh, we were reading these books with an eye toward rigor and innovative use of ethnographic methods, the contribution and depth of scholarship, and the potential for transformative impact on future educational research and practice. <laughs> Uh, so first, of course, I want to thank Dr. Oliveira and the other nine authors who submitted their works. 
And I have to say that there were really times that I wish that we had 10 awards to give away because the, the contributions that, that these scholars were making to the field were just extraordinary. And so we, we really have so many hard decisions uh, to make. I'm very grateful to have read all of his works. Um, I also, of course, want to thank the 2019 members of the review committee, many of whom are here this evening, uh, Drs. Nancy Kornberg, or Susan Lyon, and Kathy Hall, that wrote Rand Quinn and Nelson Flores. Uh, I want to give special thanks to Nana Kanita Khan, who's a graduate assistant, who was just wonderful in helping me out with everything uh, in this new process for me. And of course, I want to thank Dr. Vivian Gaston and John Campano for the support of this project this year. Uh, very excited that we could bring it together and excited that it could bring us together uh, in the forum this evening. And then finally, of course, I want to thank all of you for being uh, members of our extended community and for coming to enjoy this weekend with us. So um, without, we, I believe, it's a short announcement. Next year, I promise there will be a much fuller experience as we often will be here and be giving a talk. It'll be plaques or something like that. Uh, but for this year, it's simply the announcement. And so if you want to have that full effect, you better come back next year. <laughs> so uh, for right now, however, we're going to be uh, moving on to our evening plenary, which uh, we may have a couple of minutes, so I don't know if we need to rearrange uh, spaces. But thank you very much. And enjoy your evening. from the idea to the enactment of the idea. So thank you so much. You have no idea the work he put in, not just this award, but from before. So thanks so much. Thank so I'm going to ask um, Mary Yee, um, Suzanne O, Anki the coroner, and Jen Jung to come up to the front.
focusing on trying to think about the critical issues as we think of ethnography and education uh, moving into the, into the future. Um, so I'm going to ask the members of this panel to come up and take your seats. And here I'll give you the number. <laughs> University and G is a 2010 
graduate of our program. Her, um, she is a Spencer um, postdoctoral fellow, or she's, she just finished that, I think. And her research interests include adolescent literacy and language practices in school and out of school settings. And she has been studying how first generation immigrant students acquire academic discourses and what cultural and linguistic resources they bring to their schooling. And she launched with Sarah Michaels a uh, group of undergraduate students from Clark who did a terrific job, I understand, today. Sitting hey. hey. next to G is Brad Erickson. Um, and maybe I don't need to, to tell you who he is, but uh, um, he was the George F. Neller uh, Professor of Anthropology of Education at UCLA and was Director of Research at the Seeds U University Elementary School, which was UCLA's laboratory school. Um, prior to that, he was a faculty member in Penn GSC, and um, his writings on the microethnography of classroom and family interaction, and especially how this interaction affects disadvantaged students, continue to be widely cited. Um, he has written broadly and widely on a range of issues related to qualitative research methods for social and educational research. And um, I won't get too teary, but Brad has really been such a role model and inspiration to me over my career. Um, when he was the um, convener for the forum, and I was a new assistant professor, and um, sometimes a little lonely in the school of education. Um, he came to me with this idea. We talked about having, bringing together a group of young scholars of color um, and others who were focused on issues that had to do with culture and race, and that became the pre-four seminar. But equally important has been um, Fred's um, view of life <laughs> and the significance he attaches to human beings um, as a part of his everyday existence, but, um, but also as a part of the good works that he can do in the world. So I personally cannot thank you enough for your contributions to the field and to me. <laughs> is um, Nancy Hornberger, um, my dear colleague who's a professor of education at GSC. She's internationally known for her work in bilingualism and biliteracy, ethnography and language policy, and indigenous language revitalization. She does research, does lectures, she teaches and consults regularly on multilingual education policy and practice in the US and several places in the world. Nancy was coming up for reappointment when I came. And um, uh, I don't even know what I told you this. So she gave a talk, her, her appointment talk, real appointment talk, because we, we, we punish people in our school that way. And um, she began, you began your talk by saying, I enter into this world with a social justice framework. And I don't know if you remember that, but I came from a place where you didn't do that. And I was just, so impressed with that. And it reminded me, well, it didn't remind me, it told me that you can feel comfortable presenting your theoretical and ideological perspective and letting people know what informs the depth of your work. So thank you for that. That's the new innovation. So thank you. Next to her is Ed Brockenbrown, or my just simply call Professor Brockenbrown. He's Associate Professor of Education at Penn GSE and formerly at the um, University of Rochester's Warner Graduate School of Education. Um, he recently became here about two years ago? Yes. Yes. And his research focuses on the notions of identity, pedagogy, and power in urban educational context, particularly through the lenses of black masculinity studies and queer, queer of color critique. He's also the recipient of one of the Calvin Glenn Fellowships, which is a fellowship created to um, um, promote the study of black, um, young black boys um, and improving their life chances. So we're delighted. And of course, he's a Penn GSC graduate. <laughs> and Crystal Strong, 
So the next uh, is Assistant Professor of Education of NGSC coming here from University of California, Berkeley, and from the Anthropology Department. And she's been quite the asset here since she's arrived. Her areas of expertise include anthropology of education and politics, youth activism and cultural practices, Africa and the African diaspora, and the studies in popular culture. And everyone else here, she is focused on ethnography and qualitative research methods. Thank you so much. Yeah. And last but not least is Maria Paula Pisa, and also a graduate of GSE. Um, she's Associate Professor of Literacy Education at Teachers College, and her work, I'll tell you what her work focuses on by telling you her most recent honors, because I didn't realize this was sitting on the liter um, uh, Literacy Research Association's webpage. And it said she got two awards in the same year um, from the Literacy Research Association. The first ever Arthur Appleby Award for Excellence in Research on Literacy for a 2016 paper the laundromat at the transnational level on local young children's literacies of inter interdependence and was published in Teachers College Record. And then along with Gerald, whom she knows very loosely, <laughs> she got a book award for their book, Partnering with Immigrant Community, Communities Action Through Literacy, which was published by Teachers College Press. This is a magnificent panel, and I'm expecting a fabulous. <laughs> so, we this person to just kind of go around and offer about a three to five comments, three to five minute commentary, uh, focusing on um, the issues as you see them, and going forward in in um, thinking about ethnography, both as genre, as methodology, as method, and any form that you are thinking about. So, I just went to the first. So, yeah, it says, can we go historically? Just saying. Talk about intergenerational, right? So, no, thank you uh, uh, for the invitation to be part of this. And, and, uh, I want to say a word about uh, Vivian's uh, generosity and humanity. Uh, that's something that I've been uh, impressed with from the very beginning, and, and it continues, uh, and we're grateful for it. When, near the first time I met her, uh, this is a nice example, she, uh, um, she had a sandwich that was cut in half and she gave me half of her sandwich and uh, I've never forgotten <laughs> so uh, I've got three ideas uh, just very briefly the first has to do with a new label for something that's been going on before and um, very much here uh, in and around uh, Penn and the Forum. Um, uh, my colleagues, Chris Gutierrez and Susan Giroux, recently published a paper in which they call for something that they call uh, social design experimentation. I think that's really basically uh, participatory action research uh, with a progressive agenda. Uh, I don't think it's that much different, but if you need a new label <laughs> to persuade somebody, you could say, I'm doing social design experimentation. Um, I think here of, of the work of Elaine Simon and Johnny Christman and, and many of us here, uh, and the whole practitioner research movement, I mean, all of this is in that same spirit. So, I, I think I think it's the future needs it and it will continue. Second thing is um, the, the the normalization of audiovisual recording. Mm -hmm. Now everybody has a cell phone. Um, uh, 
we, we have YouTube, we have the idea of audiovisual recording as a way of both understanding everyday life and portraying it um, isn't weird anymore. It's part of the woodwork, and I think it will be part of the future. Everybody, uh, almost everybody now is an amateur microethnographer of interaction. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody is also an amateur narrative videographer. That's, uh, and that's going to continue to be um, um, even more active in the future. And, and it enables, among other things, um, multi-site uh, monitoring of, of everyday life. The equipment just makes it so much easier to do that now. And that's my third thing. Um, that strikes me. Multi-site ethnography is is here. That's what the award was just given for. It's going to continue. Um, um, I worry about one thing. There, there, there's a temptation, I think, to use qualitative data software as a way of storing information when you have research groups and are all over the place, literally, around the world. Uh, that can be a temptation, and there's a danger in the use of that for analysis, not for just information storage, but for analysis. I still am worried about the push to kind of what I've called premature typification um, that the software invites. So, um, anyway, there was one other thing I wanted to say about uh, audiovisual recording, and I forgot, but let me just advertise something some of you may be interested in. It's really easy to get good picture and sound now, anywhere, under any light conditions, and, and so on. That's, that's easy. It's not easy to know what to do with looking analytically at the footage. That is still something that a lot of people don't know how to do, and it could be easy to misuse mm -hmm. as, as the terrible example of the Rodney King uh, street video uh, shows us. And um, I was involved with, with a conference a couple of years ago sponsored by the Spencer Foundation in which we brought people together uh, all looking at the same two-minute video segment, uh, people from very different orientations. And there's a website now that shows uh, those people doing this, uh, and it's called, one word, learninghowtolookandlisten.com. If you're interested in that issue, uh, it's a resource for your teaching. And, uh, uh, learning how to look and listen dot com. Um, so that's it.
different aspects of research where we might encounter and do encounter methodological rich points. And by the time I got through the, the reflecting and writing of this piece, what I really wanted to say, and what I did say, was that most important for me are the relationships of humility before the rich diversity of language learning and teaching practices and contexts we have the privilege to observe and seek to understand, and respect for the language teachers, learners, and users, both individuals and communities, who untiringly and insightfully apply their language and pedagogical knowledge and skills day, and day in and day out the world over. For me, then, the most pressing issue in our ethnographic work in education is the continuing move toward more respectful and equal ways of working with and from within, borrowing Darajean's uh, words from this morning, communities in ethnographic and ethnography projects directly addressing the knowledges and practices within those communities. In some ways, ethnography and education has long been about this, <laughs> stances and relationships of humility and respect. I can remember when Fred was convening the forum, uh, one year we had Henry Trueba as our keynote. This was 1990, I looked it up. And he, I, uh, Henry said, the quality of the ethnography, of the ethnography, depends primarily on the quality of the ethnography. Mm. And this was something that I've carried with me in the years since. It was so succinct and captured so much. So again, I, I do feel that that wisdom has been with the ethnography for some time, but I think it's being articulated increasingly in recent decades. And for me, um, I've been seeing this happen in the field that I work in called the Ethnography of Language Planning and Policy, and also in the work of uh, so many indigenous researchers um, in decolonizing methodologies and indigenous research agendas. And um, researchers, Maori researchers have been very articulate about this. Many of you, I'm sure, I know, know the three by Smith's work. Also, um, the Kura Kaukapa Maori research principles that were proposed by Russell Bishop and the work by Mary Berryman, who also spoke at the forum once about culturally responsive methodologies. And this morning, we had the privilege also of hearing and, and uh, listening to Tara Jean Yassi Vince's uh, eloquent and deeply thoughtful words about moving beyond invisibility working from within Native communities to make us, these are her words, to make us visible to ourselves. To change the discourse from one of dismantling, decolonizing, and deconstructing to one of building and constructing. As she said, to bring into the knowledge spaces outside our communities that we ourselves have the answers. And her words, for me, resonated deeply also with Stacey Lee's and Fabian Dussay's words yesterday um, in telling us about uh, immigrants and refugees who lived their lives hiding in the shadows of the fear, shame, and marginalization imposed on them by a society long and increasingly filled with xenophobia and hate. They spoke of the, but they, but importantly, Stacey and Again, if she permits me to call it again, I don't know her personally. Um, the, they spoke of the ways in which staying in the shadows is disempowering and invisibilizing, and how we as educators might and must work to reframe and humanize the learners and their communities. Last comment, Tarajin, back to Tarajin again. She spoke to of moving beyond invisibility, and she asked us, do you know of this place? Have you been in this place? Have you contributed to the making of this place? And as she spoke and as she told the story of her own Navajo family growing up, I was reflecting on this place, this room, this conference, 
And on a plenary conversation in 2000, between Teresa McCarty, Terry McCarty, and her collaborator, Galina Sells Dick, a Navajo who has since passed away. But um, th this conversation led to one of the most moving mo moments I can remember at the forum, when the entire auditorium, all of you guys, waited in respectful and humble silence when a question was asked from the audience that Terry turned to Galina, and Galina took time. Mm. More than this time, much more than this time, to think about her answer before responding. And that kind of place, space, respect, and humility are for me the most pressing issue of ethnography and education in our time. Um, in, in anthropology now, there's a course that um, 
John Jackson teaches on multimodal ethnography. And he emphasizes that he focuses on the rendering, uh, rendering what's, lost, what's gained or lost when rendering the cultural world not only in words, 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 but also in images, sounds, bodies, dance theater, and other media that might serve as compelling carriers of social, cultural, and particularly analytical content. And how does that, the analytical change when um, in ethnographic work, when it does, or doesn't look the same way, when the ethnographic work is not reduced to a printed page. Um, so he's another pioneer in anthropology in um, with developing his Deb Thomas's and experimental ethnography. We have a new um, colleague, Christina Lyons, who's part of the generational shift, who's teaching experimental ethnography at the interface of the arts and sciences, which I think is very exciting. Um, and she, are, she says in her description of her class, um, what might become of anthropology, and I, I would argue ethnography too, if it were to suspend its sometimes claims to be a social science? What if it were to turn instead to exploring its affinities with art and literature as a mode of engaged creative practice carried forward in a world heterogeneously composed of humans and other humans? Um, yesterday, um, I think some of my students are here, and last, last year we did it um, for many reasons, partly because um, students were unionizing and I didn't want to break the union. We did an alternative, um, we did an alternative ethno, ethno fest and the students organized it voluntarily and um, made it completely their own and it was very exciting. And a lot of conversations emerged and there was a panel yesterday that took up some of these questions. More, I think you're here, I don't see you about um, the world of affects and how we reimagine beyond the politics of, the politics of um, reflexivity, the relations in the field, the, on an affective level, emotional level, feelings, both on the part of the ethnographer and the people that we work with. Um, so what role does, do emotions play? What role do feelings play? And then how, just I'm teaching a course on ethnographic filmmaking with a brilliant documentary filmmaker, um, uh, Ahmed Das. And we did, this is a little story that I'll show you about the legitimacy. I'm going a little bit all over the place, but I can do this on my own Um But we did a poster for incoming doctoral students. And um, in it, we described the course. And, and one of my colleagues who does quantitative work came up to me and said, ah, oh, do you do performance too? And I said, yes. And he said, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to. And, and so why, why I'm saying this is that I think we have new, it's, it's not new, and that's why I brought up Fred first, in the Black Files of Fred and We've always been legitimating what we do in education as well as anthropology and, and social sciences, et cetera, um, as ethnographers. But now that we're diversifying and challenging um, the boundaries, as well as the, as the science and sciences in research generally, and in ethnographic research, um, and the relationship between art, what is a fact, what is truth, how do we express it, how do we render it, what role do feelings play in understanding both the people who are watching what we do, listening to what we do, and experiencing um, installations and everything else in films. Um, how do we legitimate that as research in a world that's still fairly scientific. And this leads to my final point, which is that um, I've done a lot of work over the years on um, scientism and educational policy. And it hasn't been very ethnographic. It's been more discourse analysis and following policy um, developments, et cetera. Um, and theoretical work, which I do a lot of. Um, and how Scientism is so central to educational reform under neoliberalism and to what we do. Um, how do we, how does our research, ethnographic research or critical research challenge those policies? How does our work have an effect? You know, um, and how do we legitimate the truths that come from the kind of moves that particularly the younger generation, and that's what, one reason I went to the story. Um, are doing the very exciting work you guys are doing. I'm learning so much from my students and my, my, um, yeah, my next generation scholars and colleagues. Um, 
how do we make, how, do we, how does it matter beyond mattering to us and the people that are in our, our communities of practice? And, and, um, and how do we legitimate the value of what we're doing and the in this new generation of work? Um, following the footsteps of people like that. So, um, I'm for a great conversation. Thank you for including What does it mean 
when they share something with you? And what's my responsibility to that story? And that's something that I still really grapple with, how to incorporate children's perspectives and their agency more readily into my work. Um, I've done a lot of work, you know, I, I think at the intersection of ethnographic methods and practitioner research and participatory approaches. And so I think, um, for me, a pressing issue going forward is, is to make this dialogue, um, to expand that dialogue and to say, what can we learn, for example, um, from the self-reflexivity of participatory approaches? Um, what can we learn, not just for what we're documenting going on, but how can we interrupt what's going on? Because if I were to tell the classroom stories of many of the children that I work with, I don't feel that my role is to um, create another narrative of failure, of how the system is failing children. I think we know a lot about that. And so what is the role of ethnography in trying to interrupt those narratives? And also in, I think, changing institutional structures within which ethnographic research takes place. So how can we reform from community experiences, from community testimonies, the ways that institutions of higher education and of research approach the research process, the structures that are in place, the courses, uh, the tools that we learn to make it much more so, like Maria, I um, you know, really uh, got my intro to ethnography into the
speaks to the big data fetish of you know, the neoliberal university. Uh, but you know, you see it here, just all the money that's going into um, you know, creating centers for big data research and hiring people who are seen as star, you know, rising stars in big data research. So what does that mean for those of us who are in universities who want to do it not? Um, another thing I'm going to throw out there in terms of the university is arbiter. Um, particularly for those of us who are, are lucky enough to get a um, tenure track position is the way that you negotiate a mutually, um, like a, a reciprocal relationship with the communities that you do research with. Um, so I, I did a, um, an ethnography of an HIV AIDS community-based agency that worked with black and Latino queer youth. And it was a, an amazing experience. Um, I, I spent a year just hanging out there before I even said the R word research. Um, because I just wanted to be part of the community and then, you know, if, if they wanted me to do, if they allowed me to do research, great. If not, I still wanted to just support the agency. Um, but then after, I like sort of, at the, what I thought was going to be the halfway point of the study, um, the center ended up um, just going through a whole bunch of changes. The executive director got pushed out from the board. The staff didn't like the board because the board was predominantly white and was sort of standing in the way of their culturally responsive approach to doing HIV AIDS prevention services with black and Latino for youth. The staff basically came to me and said, look, you're a university professor. You kind of speak their language. You need to be on the board. Uh, and so I ended up joining the board and sort of cutting my studies short. And then very soon after that, became president of the board <laughs> and spent a year and a half rebuilding the um, organization. And basically, we, I, was praying, I basically pushed the white people off of the board who were in the way of the work that the staff was trying to do um, and brought people of color on the board who could support the culturally responsive mission. But this, this was like a second full-time job. Yeah. Um, and it became clear to me at, at a certain point that this was not going to get me tenure. <laughs> even, though, even though I was at an institution that you know, had, a, a, had social justice in its mission, you know, that kind of social justice community work would not get, get points from them, right? Um, and so uh, for those of us in universities who don't want to do ethnographies where we sort of just get our data and go, you know, how do we um, create different types of you know, mutually beneficial relationships as ethnographers with our communities in universities that don't sort of credit us for that? And where you know, we actually, our, our, our job security gets threatened if you're trying to do sort of community-engaged work that takes time and that doesn't immediately produce you know, five um, top ten journal articles. And then the last thing I'll throw out there is, um, and I think Maria started to bring this up a little bit, um, I'm going to just talk about it a bit more, um, it's sort of a question of what to share and what not to share. Um, you know, one of the things that I sort of realized pretty quickly when I was doing my research at the center was that, um, so you know, I'm, I'm an openly gay black man, I was a professor. The youth and the staff, after they got to know me, saw me as an ally. And they started sharing things with me mm -hmm. that um, you know, they might not share with outside audiences. And even in the research process, like some of them said, you can use my name and say that mm -hmm. I'm the, 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 right, but mm -hmm. I was seeing I was seeing survival practices that in some cases were effective because other people didn't know that they were survival practices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And some of those practices would have made for really fascinating you know, analyses, um, you know, articles that probably would have um, gotten me to highfalutin journals. Uh, but you know, I just, I, I personally, felt weird about sort of outing certain practices that I came to understand as effective because you all don't know about them. You all generally. Um, and this was also around the time when, I think it was in Arizona, where um, there were some researchers who were working with undocumented youth and the state was going after yeah. their data. Yeah. Right. Um, the examiner were actually, I think I had a conversation with you once about if I should do those confidentiality yeah. um, agreements or certificates, which you know are of 
questionable use when the state is intent on um, getting the people that you are working with. So all that's a long-winded, rambling way of saying that the sort of what to share, what not to share, is this uh, big tension for me, particularly when the populations I'm working with at, are actually sort of trust me to share that knowledge responsibly, but I sort of have a different vantage point of the state possibly using my work um, for dubious purposes um, and for you know, outside audiences to disrupt certain survival practices if you actually know that those practices are there. I mean, I, I sort of came to kind of appreciate, and it's kind of ironic or whatever, but you know, as a, as a queer researcher who does queer work, I've actually come to appreciate the closet um, as a, a mode of ethnographic research mm -hmm. and sort of keeping certain things mm -hmm. closeted um, because uh, publicizing certain practices actually might not serve certain vulnerable populations. Um, I'll end there. Some people, but not all. 
In response to my silence, she adds, I believe in all kids, but not all teachers. I'm reminded, as the three vignettes illustrate, that we, as ethnographers, need to commit or recommit to fostering relationships of inquiry with all teachers, even the ones we find puzzling or problematic. Over the years, many teachers have told me that they feel scrutinized or misunderstood by researchers, and worse, attacked in admired scholarship. That these same teachers are looking for powerful approaches to teaching and learning that can help them navigate the challenging conditions of their reality. So the relationship between ethnographers and teachers is not a new theme, and in fact, challenging the reductive deficit discourse around teachers has been pivotal to the work of the forum, especially the practitioner inquiry day. But this is something that deserves our renewed attention, especially with the increasingly negative discourse around public education and educators. So how we position K-12 teachers in our work, for me, has deep implications. It can influence how our scholarship gets taken up in schools and classrooms. And it can influence whether we can even continue to learn in and from classrooms. That's what I believe is critical for strengthening the power of ethnographic research is creating partnerships for change between teachers and researchers. And unless we can create these partnerships with teachers, our work won't resonate with the very people many of us wish to engage with. According to June Jordan in the report from the Bahamas, partnerships of change go beyond identifying the common enemy, whether that enemy is social inequality or institutional racism. And Jordan says that these partnerships begin when we begin to ask what we can do for one another. So as an ethnographer, I've been thinking a lot about what we can do for teachers, for their humanity and dignity. how I think about 
my practice as an ethnographer. In addition to that, before I had any dream or imagination of being an academic, I was involved and am still involved and understand myself as an activist, as an organizer, right? And so, in many ways, the, the way that I think about the work of ethnography is as much informed by my training as it is by my practice in organizing work. The kinds of sensitivities, the ethical considerations are very similar, right? And it shouldn't be shocking that I, I do work on activism <laughs> in that light. And I'll also say that, you know, for me, Part of what research and the question of research has always been is how can this be used in service of justice? Yeah. And it became especially important because in 2010 when I was leaving for my doctoral field work, uh, UC Berkeley was in the midst of Occupy Cal, mm -hmm. right, which was the precursor to the Occupy movement. When I came back in 2013 after a year and a half in the field, or 2012 I should say, you know, we were seeing the beginning stages of the Black Lives Matter movement. So for me, I think the generation of scholars who sort of came up and came out in the past five years or so, the question of what this work means when the world is undergoing the kinds of changes that we're seeing, that we're grappling with, you know, became not just an intellectual question, it became a question for our very survival in these spaces that in some ways reinforce the problems that we're seeing outside of the academy. I'll also say that how I understand ethnography um, is very much um, in grappling with, and I appreciate you bringing up the Ruth Bankar quote, and specifically naming <coughs> empire and coloniality as a tradition and an aspect of the work of ethnography that we have to grapple with, right? What does it mean that this practice is formed in the context of empire? What does that mean for us who see ourselves as inheritors of this? And so for me, I'll say that ethnography is about an ethical approach to humanity. It's about saying that there's a value to, ex to experience. It's about saying that there's a value in deep connection to people. It's in saying that there's a value in honoring the ways that people understand their own experiences and navigate their worlds. And I'll also say for me that it means long and slow engagement, right? I've been very fortunate to be doing research um, in a place, uh, most of my work so far has been in higher educational institutions in southwestern Nigeria. I've been at this for 13 years now, in addition to other work that I've taken up since then. But I see um, ethnography as opening up this possibility of sustained relationships, and also the idea of being transformed in the course of doing the work, and also being able to witness transformation if you are around long enough to do so, right? Um, and so I'll say in terms of these questions that many of us have put forward about well, what are the emerging issues? What are the things that we're grappling with? For me, power is always going to be at the foundation of the question of ethnography. Also, what is knowledge production and who is it for? And as well, um, and I'm appreciative of Ed's comments around how the um, neoliberal university and its constraints uh, forces in many ways us to speed up work that should be slow, right, and intentional. And so I'll say to that that for me, my starting point is understanding that at present, research is an unequal exchange. I benefit much more from the work that I do than my interlocutors do, right? And part of our charge is that we can't and should not maintain this imbalance. And the question for me becomes, how do we shift this? Is it possible to shift this? And I think um, just the, the, the way that the world has changed, the way that research has changed, requires us to do so. We can't maintain this idea of separation between the field and home, right? It's virtually non-existent, even if you do research in the same place. For me, you know, today, earlier, I was on WhatsApp with someone I've known from my field 
for 10 years at this point. Things like social media mean that, you know, people can keep track of us, right? They can make demands on us, and they should be able to make demands on us. And I think part of what I'm, I've been thinking most about is, well, what kind of demands and what forms of reciprocity are we able to make space for in this moment? And I think that's a very important question for us. Um, and what does it look like to collaborate? I think that there are so many conversations about participatory research, collaborative research. Um, we have a conversation about it, but I don't know that we talk enough about like what we need to be able to make that meaningful, right? Not just in word, but also in deed. And so part of what that looks like for me is thinking about how to leverage the resources that I have access to in ways that are not just lip service. It means how do I do work that is not just beneficial and interesting to US academic audiences, but also that my interlocutors in Nigeria who are also in the work of knowledge production, who also see themselves as engaged in um, these questions in a very deep way, how do I do work that is also meaningful to them? And then, for me, the last thing I'll say is how do we redistribute the power, the capital, both economic and social, and the legitimacy that exists in current configurations of knowledge production? And I, and I would love to see um, more earnest and tangible conversations about what it looks like to think about those dynamics. So I'll end there. Worlds. 
different ways of experiencing and conceiving that aren't just about cultural differences, but are substantially different ways of experiencing the world. And then what does equality and ethics mean if you have a different set of ontological commitments and ways of experiencing the world, right? Yeah. And what is knowing? Who knows? Um, how do you know you know? Who can know? Who has a right to know? So I think um, when, you com when, I, when, when people complicate knowing and, and coming to know in those ways and, and the value of change, I think sometimes I feel like we in the West, not sometimes, I really am excited by what's going on in terms of decolonizing um, research generally and theory in particular from what problematically gets called the South. Because I think it's opening up, and Joe, you do a lot of work in this area. I think it's opening up spaces for us to, in white West and all of us in the West to buy into this model of science to, and even ethnographic science to step back and question and the humility in, in new ways um, and to learn from the people we're privileged to get to know in more fundamental mm -hmm. ways. And what's the value, what's the role for, of activism in relation to that is really interesting. Anyway, that's not, but yeah. Whatever you say is the last. Anyone else? <coughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking about something that uh, a friend and colleague of mine that a number of us know uh, has said, um, Ray McDermott yeah. uh, um, has a has 50 lines, and one of them is he says that uh, what anthropology has learned both in prehistory and then in contemporary uh, studies of people around the world, including people like people who are right here, because we're all anthropologists, and is isn't just, uh, and, and, and in some ways we're all other. Us and them, uh, but at any rate, he says. He says uh, two things have have come up over and over as you look at human life. One is everybody's busy, <laughs> uh, and then the, the expansion of business. It isn't that you know some people are busy and other people aren't. It isn't that rich people are busier than poor people. It isn't uh, that uh, immigrants are less busy than, than uh, 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 people who aren't immigrants. And, and, uh, and then he says the other thing um, that's been discovered over and over again is that everybody's making sense. Uh, and again, it's not that Native Americans aren't making sense in the way that big data researchers who are getting big grants at the university are making sense, or, and so on, and so on. Everybody's making sense. Some of the sense we may not like, some of the sense we may not agree with, but it is sense. And, and if you take that position, then everybody you're going to meet is busy about living their lives and they're making some kind of sense, you simply can't do the deficit narrative. Right? So in that sense, there's, a, I think, a fundamental uh, liberatory uh, uh, message there. And, and so, you know, how does it make sense for a kid in the bottom reading group, which itself doesn't happen, make sense, but how, how does it make sense to spend years uh, not learning to read? There's some kind of a sense there, and, and to be able to hone in on that uh, uh, it has fundamentally, I think, liberatory uh, potential. How do you 
you interrogate your own looking uh, and the sense that you're making because your sense may be wrong. And so coming to ethnography as a teacher, coming to ethnography as a language minority student who was not framed well by big data when mm -hmm. experience, I want to make ethnographic methods be a part of social transformation, but I think it has we have to think about who are the audiences that we're speaking to and how may our meaning be wrong and how can we make them better through dialogue. I really appreciate um, the distinction I hear you making between the kind of personal and the disciplinary or institutional. I think that's very important, um, especially for me because I, I hesitate to give ethnography or any methodological approach, this kind of power as um, inherently anything, including transformative, um, especially because of, you know, the ways in which even in this moment we see the continuation of these kind of colonial counters, even if we're not talking about international research, right? If we think about extractive relationships that still exist and you know the university structure in some ways kind of supports that because of the speed with which people are made to, to do their work um, and then you know I'm, I'm glad we're naming social reproduction um, because you know we know as folks who do work in schools that the school is both the site of potential and disruption but it also plays such an important role at being resistant to change and maintaining the status quo, and the university is certainly a key part of that. Um, but what I do find promising, though, um, is, is this potential piece. And I find promising the way that ethnography critiques positivity, or positivism, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Not positivity, but you know, positivism. <laughs> um, you know, it requires that we be in deep relationship with people um, that I think opens up transformative potential. It, it is premised on deep understanding that I find transformative potential in that as well. Can I just call out um, our friend Alex over there, who had a great book come out this year that he couldn't award because he was in the award. It's part of a movement I think is really, really important of anthropologists education and anthropologists and broadly ethnographers studying institutions of higher education. Um, and not just you know, sort of mm -hmm. broad notions of social reproduction, but the everyday minutia of how power works. So it's like meritocracy. So he's on the vanguard of us looking at ourselves as a institution. So a couple of folks talking about what we I have kind of a couple thought questions. Um, but I really want to build on, you know, critical kind of naming colonialism and empire. And one thing that I keep thinking about during this conversation is how so much qualitative research in, in education that uses ethnographic methods, how deeply ethnocentric it still remains. Um, and, and they're real, and I'm saying, speaking for myself in my own work, as editors at the AD and I, like if we get an article, you know, from another part of the world, like we don't even know how to understand it. We can't even find reviews, you know, for it. And I think tied up with that is really the importance of, of you know, one of the legacies of, of course, one was in this just nationhood. And what does that mean to think outside nationhood and be self-reflexive about the ways in which the university system is really implicated, you know? in those colonial histories around nationhood. And, and you know, we're working with Dr. Yolanda um, on trying to have a transnational partnership, you know, with the um, University of Guadalajara. And the reason, you know, and we're, you know, it's not even about like a multi-site comparative thing or looking at the education system in Mexico versus the United States. And the ethical part of it is that the young people we work with in the school system, they're imaginations and their intellectual lives and their emotional lives don't conform to national boundaries. But this education system does, right? And so there's just a really kind of like profound disconnect. 
and it's really hard to kind of think and work through that. So that's kind of like one thought question. And the other thing I was thinking about is, you know, I've always embraced like the teacher research movement, practitioner research movement, and you mentioned participatory approaches and uh, partnerships for change. And I really appreciate the comments that that's just the beginning, maybe that's just the beginning of thinking through that work. And how do we, and this is not the right word, but how do we democratize academic inquiry in a certain kind of way, but in a way that, and I've mentioned this in a few sessions, that doesn't flatten difference, right? Especially when difference is epistemically productive, right? So when Joanne has elders in, in her project that have wisdom and knowledge, right? and epistemic privilege, how is that mobilized in the research? You know, um, our youth who are navigating um, these very hostile school systems, how is their knowledge valued? And even university-based researchers may have something you know, to share, but, but thinking about difference and multiplicity in these very, very complex projects that happen over time, I think we're just at the very beginning stages of trying to, you know, I don't know, capture that. And John is of English. Judge my colleague Amy up there about having to be from Japan and having to publish in English. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we turn to the audience? Without. yesterday about um, all those researchers who don't write in English and they don't get read. Exactly. So I don't know if you want yeah. to say something. Yeah. Sure, definitely. Yesterday uh, with Nancy were talking about the idea that there's so much knowledge every, anywhere in the world, like in Latin America, in the global South, like in South Asia. And then the comment was like, like well, we don't know other languages, so we just don't read them. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, there are, I would say, hundreds of journals in Latin America that have been written in English, and other languages like Portuguese and Spanish, etc. So my suggestion to professors here in Latin America is there is a way in your, in your courses that you sort of paper some, some journals and some articles from the Global South that are already written in English. It's just that they are not being published in this stuff here. And journals, right? So my invitation to everybody is more like just prepare a couple of um, you know articles from the global south to start getting the conversation that the knowledge is not only produced in North America but also in Brazil, like uh, like in Colombia, Venezuela, I don't know, maybe Turkey and so on and so forth, China, Japan, etc. So yeah, thank you once for being here. Thank you. 
based on the discussion uh, that we are having, that uh, a top entry could be ethnic entry as part of the linguistic sector. But also, in the other side, this component of uh, non conflictual relationships, because that doesn't um, articulate the, the world in the right way for indigenous cultures. So I want to break the discussion how this indigenous uh, way of knowing could intervene to enrich this discussion of that, those negative uh, aspects that have been discussed. What do you think? Tearing apart his work is just, for me, 
very transformational, the way she names the work a place. Um, the idea that Navajos in our community uh, built a school so that children could be Navajo, and we call it a place to be Navajo. Uh, this, this is the kind of work that communities have the ability to build. And, it, and they get built outside, as I talked about in my talk, they get built outside of the structures of these institutions. And they're out there. So I just keep wanting to say, don't reverberate the same conversation about what the academy is holding us back from. We have really amazing choices to make around the possibilities with ethnography as a tool, or one of the tools, to, to thinking about this and documenting processes. As I said in my talk, starting over and over and over again until we figure out what's, what's the next step. So I, thank you, Dr. Yolanda. I appreciate you um, asking this question again. I think that it reaches a discussion. I just want to add two things about the ethnography is like that see the discussion. One is that uh, the morning talk about the other side of invisibility. I think that the work that, uh, particularly from this approach of you, and as I say, is that when you work with the communities like the ones we have this afternoon, patients with the kids, you disclose huge uh, amount of problems that otherwise would be known by academia, by society, by structures. So I think we cannot be that harsh about the property if it's working for the social benefit. It's working from the perspective of the people who are um, affected by inequality and, uh, and social justice, uh, social justice, I would say. So I think that we need to balance both. Well, we're gonna, that was lovely. Very good to I want to thank our, our panel. Um, I think the points of respect and humility are kind of central and how I've tried to do whatever version of ethnography that I do. And we should be humble, it seems to me, because people actually allow us to invade parts of their lives that they sometimes never allow other people to see and respectful of how we how we talk about that. So this panel is just magnificent. So has been so out. is this audience? Gerald? No, I just I just personally had a wonderful two days and I learned so much. And I just it's a big thing to, to travel, to take planes, to leave your family, to leave other parts of your life, to attend a conference, and the sacrifices you made to join and be part of this intellectual dialogue over the past two days, you really, it's a blessing for us, and we're just very grateful, and I hope you enjoy dinner. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.